Grief is not something that is often discussed in Canadian society and grief education in general is often neglected. Numerous myths exist around grief. DWDC's mission is that through advocacy, public education and personal support, DWDC ensures Canadians have access to quality end of life choice and care. It can be argued that quality end of life care transcends into grief education as it's something that affects not only the dying person but also the family and friends that are left behind. Grief literacy is in no way a clinical offering, but instead is one that focuses on public education. I would now like to invite you all watching from home to light a candle if you feel called to do so, and if your space allows it, to honor the people we're speaking about and anyone in your lives whose memory is at the top of mind today during the session. So today's topic is children and grief, perspectives, support, and discussions. And we're joined by Lisa Robinson, who's a social worker and grief counselor. And she'll discuss how to best understand and support a child through grief and how to honor their unique experiences. So thank you for joining Lisa and I'll pass it over to you. Perfect, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm just going to um, get my slides up here and then we'll get going. So there we go. All right, I hope that right now everyone is seeing uh, the title slide, Children in Grief, Perspective, Support and Discussions, and that this is where you're expecting to be today as well. Um, as Sam said, my name is Lisa Robinson, and yes, I'm a grief counselor, and I work specifically with children um, and youth and some young adults as well. And I found myself in this area of work after working with uh, critically ill and palliatively and palliative children um, for quite some time. I realized that um, the way that I was doing it previously, while very valuable, was not what I wanted to continue to be doing. So I, I kind of shifted over and went back and did my master's of social work. And now I do this in private practice, as well as doing a lot of grief literacy education. Um, especially around how to include children in the experience of death and dying and how to have conversations about grief. So uh, what you can expect today, um, we've done some introductions, but if you feel uh, comfortable and you want to, I invite you to put your name, maybe what kind of role or capacity uh, you have that brings you here today and where you are located. Uh, absolutely no pressure to do that if you'd prefer not to but it is always cool to see where people are coming from for these sorts of things. Um, we're gonna talk about death and dying and specifically key things that we need to remember when talking to children about death and dying. Uh, we're gonna talk about what grief is and what it is not in the context of children. Um, also, this generally applies across all humans. Uh, there are some key differences, which I'll point out, how we can support each other in times of grief, and then hopefully we'll have a, a good chunk of time for questions as well. So if you do have questions, you don't have to hold them till the end, just pop them in the chat box um, and we'll keep track of them. We will answer them at the end, however. Perfect. So talking about death and dying, I think uh, it is really uncommon to just introduce this in everyday um, conversation with children, but the reality is that this is coming up every day for everyone and more so than ever in the environment that we live in right now. It is definitely very much top of mind that we're going on to, I think it's a year and a half of COVID and the news has definitely has been full of information about what the impacts of COVID are, including death and dying um, of various people. And on a scale that hasn't really been seen globally, um, I also think about uh, the fact that there's a lot of media that children engage with that include uh, concepts of death and dying. And a big one that comes up in my work a lot is video games. Uh, a lot of video games, the premise is your character dies, um, then you start the level again and they come back. And that's a really, uh, really interesting and different view on death, which is not accurate. So talking about death and dying, I think is very important. And when we do that, we wanna make sure that we're kind of start all starting from a similar perspective with some key definitions. So I just wanna run us through these so that we all know um, what they mean. We have bereavement, and that's the state of having experienced the death of someone. 
Grief, it's one, one's reaction to a loss. And I wanna be really clear here that grief doesn't just happen in the context of death. Uh, grief is a very human experience that is, yeah, the response that we have, all of the thoughts and feelings that exist for someone around any loss or even a big change. And I think, um, I think sometimes we can um, conceptualize this just in a negative change, but there are some changes that have positivity in them as well, or even like a lot of joy. And I don't want to ascribe this uh, experience to everyone, but something that I think of that has both grief and a lot of joy often in it is becoming a parent. And yes, that is often something that people want and they've made an active choice for um, and they're very excited for, but it doesn't mean that there isn't loss and change involved and there isn't the opportunity to grieve what has happened previously. And with children, a lot of children that I work with will talk about grief experiences in the context of yes, a death, but also in the context of maybe changing friend groups or moving schools or a shift in how your family structure is, whether it be divorce or separation or even an older sibling going off to post-secondary school or moving out. So there's lots of experiences that bring about grief and it's not just death, but death is certainly one that brings a lot, a lot um, of weight with this experience of grief. When I think about grief, uh, we often see it portrayed as um, overwhelming sadness. Um, a lot of ways that we'll see it acted out is with a lot of crying, and it looks like a lot more than that. It is every feeling that we feel. So that can be sadness, it can be anger, it can be frustration, it can be confusion. There's also a lot of space for happiness in grief. And what that can look like is being able to hold on to the happy memories or just reminding children that it is okay to have a happy moment even when something terrible has happened. Um, it's that balance and it's actually as humans how we kind of regulate ourselves and find equilibrium when when something terrible has happened. Um, I also always wanna call out things like relief in death. And this can come when perhaps a child has watched um, someone they care about suffer throughout their illness or, um, or whatever has brought them to, uh, to death. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that relief is an okay thing to feel. It can also happen if you have a really complicated or harmful relationship with someone. So, um, so it's, it's not always just going to be sad when someone dies. I had one of, one of my clients describe it to me as it's like all the feelings hitting you in the face at once. Um, and I think that's really true. And it's a lot of confusion and it's a lot for little bodies. It's a lot for big bodies to carry. And it's a lot for little bodies as well, because what we know is grief is not just a cognitive or emotional experience. It's a physical experience. It's a, um, a spiritual experience. And it's a lot. We have mourning. This is the external expression of grief. Um, pretty much every culture, every space will have certain mourning rituals that, um, that are available or have been practiced for a long time. Um, this has been a really big thing that we've been working through with clients and families as people die, as I'm sure um, Dying with Dignity Canada has as well in this time, is that the way that we usually mourn often involves collecting as a group to remember, to hurt, to cry, to laugh, whatever it is. And this has looked really different over the last year and a half. And um, I think what, what I've really seen is without that being available to us, how important it is. Because we know that one of the most important factors in coping with grief is finding community and is connecting um, because it can feel really isolating. Uh, we also have disenfranchised grief, and this is grief that's not acknowledged in society. And I actually think children are um, victims of this, so to speak, in the sense that sometimes we forget that children can understand these concepts and this tough stuff and that they themselves have the capacity to feel these huge feelings. We'll talk a little bit about how they show up and why sometimes we might miss it and they are disenfranchised in their grief. Um, because children don't always have the words uh, and often it comes out in behaviors or more physical ways, but we will certainly talk about what that looks like so that we can better identify it and have that conversation with them. Um, 
I often find with my clients that I'll ask them, like, have you, what do you know about the word grief? And they'll be like, I don't, I don't know that word. Um, but then once we start to pull it apart, they're like, oh yeah, no, it's like this feeling and this feeling and this feeling. And then I have all these grief thoughts that come with, with my grief as well. Um, and I think uh, disenfranchised grief can also apply just to speak to more the universal experience um, with a lot of different uh, experiences that come along with it. I think often about um, miscarriage. Um, I do like to think that the conversation is shifting a little bit, but historically and continuing, it's not always the most uh, forefront or visible uh, experience of grief. So this might be something where someone feels really alienated in their grief, or we might have a pet death. Sometimes that's not placed at the center like a person or a human death is. Um, but pets hold really important parts in our lives. And it's important to recognize that. And, um, and for children, yeah, their, their grief as a whole can sometimes be disenfranchised or even their experiences that maybe aren't as obviously um, grief driven. So this might be, like I said, switching schools or even switching friend groups. That can be really hard sometimes um, if, there's bullying happening and a child eventually chooses not to be involved in that anymore. doesn't mean that they aren't going to have uh, grief reactions. And the reason that I talk about all these different types of grief is because one, it's important to name things. Um, and two, because what we know about grief is that it is not um, an isolated incident in the sense that like, oh, we just had something terrible happen and all of the other hard things that have brought about grief, all our thoughts and feelings around those just disappear. It's not like that. It can, it is a very cumulative experience. And so when I talk to children, we'll often make kind of, we'll quantify um, the grief experiences and we'll look at like, what are all the ways that these thoughts and feelings have shown up before? And that can be really validating, especially if they're feeling like what has brought them to a place where they feel like they can't cope anymore is not valid in the uh, enormity of how it feels. So I, I like to say that we live in a grief phobic death illiterate society. And I think that that is only magnified for children. And we have a lot of myths and misconceptions about what children should and should not engage in around death and dying. And I think this really impacts their experience of grief and their understanding of grieving because they, they are so far removed from um, this experience sometimes. So the first myth is that children should not be at the bedside of the dying. Um, all of these things I want to acknowledge come from a place of wanting to protect children and wanting to keep them away from sadness and anger and all of those tough feelings. Um, but as humans, we're not supposed to be comfortable all the time. And what we know about children is that they do better if they know what to expect because that brings predictability and they can feel more in control. And what that can look like with children being by the bedside of the dying is making sure that they know what it will look like before they go. So we're gonna go visit grandma. And you might notice that her skin looks a little more gray, that when you touch her hand, it feels cold, that she looks, uh, that she looks a lot smaller in the hospital bed. Her breathing might be a little bit more difficult, um, all those sorts of things. And just giving them the full picture so that they themselves can make an informed choice about what feels right for them. And often um, when children are by the bedside of the dying, that is when they have their most powerful grief experiences and especially the opportunity to connect with someone as they're dying. Uh, I had one client who um, was a little bit older, about 10 years old, and, uh, and they were, they were, kind of coming to the end of their mother's life, she had cancer. And, um, and we had this conversation about, do you wanna be at the bedside of, um, of your mom as she's dying? And they were like, no way, no how, absolutely no interest in that. So I said, okay, could we talk about what that would look like a little bit and figure out so that you know what exactly you'd be walking into and you can decide. Cause I think sometimes we just think, nope, that'll be too scary. Uh, we see some pretty dramatic deaths on TV, um, but it's not always like that. Uh, so we talked about what it might look like. I still said, you know what? Not my thing. Don't want to do it. When it actually came to um, 
the, the time well, when mom was actively dying, um, the client decided to stay with mom and actually ended up decorating her body with flowers um, and spending some time just laying there with the body and saying goodbye. And that for them provided a lot of comfort they felt very connected in that moment as their mother died, and it has stayed a very positive memory for them throughout. So it may not be that for every child, but letting them know and offering them ways to be with someone who is dying is incredibly important so that they can feel like an active part if that's what they need or want to do. Another one, preschoolers are too young to understand concepts related to death. In just a moment, I'll talk a little bit about what ages and stages um, we go through as children and what we can and cannot understand. But the reality is that preschoolers, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, they can understand certain elements of death and in that we'll react to those elements. So their grief will be reactive to those parts of what death brings about. So just we'll go through that in the next slide and, and explore that a little bit more. We need to protect children from thinking about death and or their loved ones who have died or their people who have died. Um, they're thinking about it anyway. There is no way that they're not. And if they're holding it all inside, children have amazing imaginations. Um, and a lot of the work I do is figuring out what children, what, what the child, um, what their narrative has become about their person who is dying. And then working backwards around any parts that are bringing fear and are not along, in line with the truth. And so what we actually need to do is we need to talk to them and make sure they do understand what's happening and they understand what their role can be and they get the chance to do what they need or want to do. Also, like I said, death is kind of everywhere. Um, so they're thinking about it in some capacity pretty often, maybe not in the forefront, maybe it's a little more in the background. For example, like I said, video games. Um, but there's a lot of movies. Most Disney movies have something in there that has something to do with death. So having these conversations it's already around them, we're not going to we're not going to make them think about it more. Funerals or visitations are traumatizing for young children. Maybe, absolutely, there can be parts of it that are really distressing, and that's why I think it's again so important to go through with a child what to expect at a funeral or visitation come up with a plan if they need to leave or take a break, let them know where their safe places and safe people are, um, and then let them make the best decision for themselves. Uh, it can be very confusing for a child if all of a sudden someone's taken away from the house um, or from a space and then they just never see them again. Um, it's hard for them to understand what happened. Uh, if it's not explained to them or they don't get a chance to be part of, of the morning. Um, if told about death, ch children will think about it all the time. I kind of addressed that before. I, that's not true. Children are great at um, being in what's hard and then moving outside of it and, uh, and moving into the whatever's next for them. It's actually built into how we cope as humans. And I think sometimes as adults, our thinking part of our brains, our cognition actually gets in the way of being naturally able to go from something really hard to um, something that is lighter and allows us to find some relief and children. Um, generally are, are pretty good at that if we give them the space and, and the structure to be able to do that. So understanding death, excuse me, I'm just going to have a drink of water. Um, I want to be really careful. We know that ages and stages developmentally are not necessarily reflected in these specific year um, chunks, but just in trying to give some sort of guidance around what it might look like as as our understanding evolves and changes about death. Um, obviously, this will be different for for, for children as they, as they develop as they need to. But generally under two-ish years, um, children are not gonna be able to really understand the concept of death, it's very abstract, but they're still gonna react to the separation of their loved one so or of their person. So they are going to still have the experience of missing them. There's gonna be a lot of confusion for them because they can't understand why they're not coming back. Um, and they, yeah, they're still going to struggle with that separation. Three to four years old, um, ish, they'll be able to understand that death is a changed state, but won't really be able to understand the permanency or the universal experience of death. From five to six, they're starting to develop a mature concept of death. They can understand that it's a very final experience and that, um, the body stops working. Essentially, it's not functional. Um, but they may not understand that this actually applies to not just 
their person who died, but everyone and themselves. Uh, somewhere around nine, 10, um, a full understanding of all components of death come about. And so this understanding of death helps us to understand what certain grief milestones might look like or why I might have a client at the age of three, we do the work that we can cognitively at that point around understanding what has happened to their person, to their body, but not be, but then they might have to come, they might have another moment or time in their life where all of a sudden they're starting to realize that like, oh, this really means they're not coming back and their body will never work again. And then start to understand, oh my gosh, and that's going to happen to me one day. And we might have another grief wave as that kind of comes up for them and they might come back and we might have to work through that because they are now at a new um, stage and age um, and have a deeper understanding and then our feelings and um, thoughts about it kind of evolve with that. Also think it's important to recognize that by 10 years old, we have a fully formed, we have the ability to have a fully formed understanding of death. Um, something that's really interesting in my work um, is around that like nine, 10, 11 year old age, uh, a lot of like existential crises come up because this realization that like, I can die. What does that mean? What does it mean if this person died and this person didn't? And what happens after we die? All of these things really start to come to the forefront. Um, and I think that that's a really important part of grief work is acknowledging that, yeah, we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of unknowns and keep asking these questions, keep wondering about it. It's important in, um, in understanding yourself and your place in this world and in this whole thing. So whatever age you are talking to about death, um, we do a really good job of trying to distance ourselves from death in a lot of ways and language is one way that's particularly interesting to me. I think it's, we have something like 270-ish euphemisms for death. That's ways to say death without actually using that word. We'll use things like grandpa's gone or we've lost your parent or your caregiver passed away or they've gone to sleep. And for us, who have, for adults who have grown up and been able to kind of lean in the, con, um, the context of what those mean, we understand. Um, but for children, if this is their first introduction to someone dying and they learn that we lost their caregiver, people lose their keys, people lose their shoes, it happens all the time. Kids lose things a lot. Um, and then someone helps them find it or they themselves find it. Um, and that means it's back. And so we're setting children up for often a, a great misconception when we're not using the words of dying, death and died. Um, I think about this, especially, I have uh, had several clients where they have felt like their person is somewhere. Um, they often have a very specific place. One of my clients, their specific places. They really felt that their mom was stuck in a bubble somewhere and that it was their job to go find the bubble. They just needed to figure out how to pop it and then they would be able to bring their mom back. And so what we have there is this huge sense of responsibility as well as an impossible task to, um, to do what they most want to do. But they've created this narrative. And for us as adults, we're gonna be sitting there and be like, that doesn't make any sense. There's no way that could happen. But again, children walk that line between magical thinking and being stuck, being um, steeped in reality as well. And so that might be feel really true for them. And therefore they wake up every day thinking that they need to find their person and do this thing so that they can come back. And they go to bed every night thinking, I didn't do it. I didn't do what I needed to do to make sure that my mom could come back. And when we talk about like passed away, that's, that's confusing. When we actually break down those words, passed to where, went away to where, um, gone, it's very ambiguous, uh, gone to sleep. A lot of children will then have a lot of fears attached to sleeping. Um, sometimes we'll describe death as it might look like they're sleeping if they're going somewhere with an open casket or something like that. Um, but being very careful to differentiate, but they are not sleeping because we wake up from sleeping. Um, yeah, and then, as I said, about 270 other ones, uh, one of them that is 
particularly confusing, I think, kicked the bucket. Um, one that sticks out in my mind often, I'll often talk about that one. But yeah, if you, if you yourself have any euphemisms that you've heard that you're like, oh man, I don't know, um, feel free to pop it in the chat box because there really are so many out there. So obviously we wanna use, well, not obviously, now I've said <laughs> that we wanna use uh, death and dying and died in our language when we're speaking to children. And, and I would encourage you to use that when you're speaking to people in general, uh, cause that is what has happened or is going to happen. Um, we also wanna make sure we explain what that word means <laughs> to children because that again is just a word until it has meaning. So uh, the way that I will explain this is, um, by being very concrete about the physicality of death. There's a whole other realm of death and grief that is important to acknowledge, which is belief systems and hopes and what we think happens after a body dies. Um, that's not what I'm there to ascribe for them or tell them to believe um, or anything like that. I can talk in just a minute about how I address that part of it when it comes up. But specifically when we are working to make sure under the children understand the concrete nature of death, um, I'll say when someone dies, their body stops working and it will never work again. This means that their body's eyes can't see, the ears can't hear, and they can't feel um, fear or pain anymore. So we wanna be really concrete because children are very concrete. And we wanna make sure that we're talking about how the body stops working and that it's final, it's never gonna work again. And you can obviously whatever comes naturally to you, you wanna sound authentic, children can tell when you're not. Um, but what does, what does that look like as far as some examples go? Their eyes can't see, their ears can't hear. And I think it's really important to include that this means that their body can't feel fear or pain anymore because when we get into maybe some of the more like what happens after a body dies, there can be an element of fear for children or they can be very worried about pain. This often comes up when we talk about cremation, um, the pain part or the fear part when we talk about burying a body underground. Um, so just making sure that they know that bodies can't feel that anymore. And then there's the other part of how we talk about death and dying and, and continued connection, which is so important in, in grief for children with that person. Um, and we have the, the idea of what happens to whether I like to describe it as the part of that person that made them your person. We might use soul or essence as other ways to describe that. And um, when children ask about that, uh, that's a good time to wonder with them to say, you know, no one knows for sure. It's a great mystery. Children really identify with the idea of a mystery, but what do you think might happen? And this is a good time to explore with them, like what they think might happen and how based on that belief, um, we can work with that to create ongoing connection with their person after they've died, because um, a big part of grief is continuing to feel connected to the per your person who has died. Um, and this looks really different depending on whether you think they might be in heaven or have they been reincarnated or do you think that their, their soul is around you or their spirit is around you, all these sorts of things um, can really help us to decide an appropriate way for children to continue to feel connected to them um, as, they, as they move through their grief. So when death comes up, there are kind of four C's that I like to consider when talking to children about this. And, um, and often when children are asking questions about uh, death or um, trying to make sense of their grief in a way, the, a lot of the questions and worries can come back to this. Um, so remembering these and addressing them, not just once, not just twice, but three or four times with children can be really helpful. And it especially depends on the, the way in which the person died. Um, so I'll talk about this and how I talk about it around death, um, but you can extrapolate as far as like, how do you use this if someone died um, by cancer, by COVID, uh, many different things. So I think children will often wonder if they, um, if they can catch death. This idea of, um, oh, one person in my life died. Does that mean this person and this person that I'm going to die? And is it contagious in a way? And yes, we know that this is not necessarily the most logical thing, but children understand their world through patterns and things that are consistent versus things that are not. And so if this has been their really central experience recently, 
then, um, then they might start to think that this can happen. And this can bring about a lot of fear of their own mortality around their own mortality, or especially if they've had um, a parent or caregiver die and they come from a household that has two parents or two caregivers and kids are quick to do that math. Wait, I had two, now I have one. And the way that, that, that we got to one could easily happen to my other parent. And they start to really feel worried about that, or they might feel really worried and I'm hypervigilant about their own well-being. Um, cause it. Did you cause the death? A lot of kids feel a lot of responsibility, whether it be because of some direct action they took or the absence of certain actions. So I've been working with a client lately who feels very strongly that um, they did not spend enough time with their grandfather in the hospital and that because of that, um, he died. And so they believe that because they weren't there, this was pre-COVID, so they had the opportunity to be there. Um, they, they have somehow caused it, um, which is a really heavy thing to carry. And I cannot tell you how many children I've worked with where I've just straight up been like, there was nothing you needed to do or you could have done that would have changed this outcome. And we'll go back and we'll actually talk about how the body stopped working and how there was nothing that they'd done. And the amount of relief, you can almost watch their shoulders drop um, and then take a deep breath because they've been carrying this idea around. And as a child, imagine saying that to someone you care about. Like, I think I'm the reason that this other person we both care about died. Like, that is terrifying. What if someone says, yeah, you're right and confirms that idea? I'd hold it in too if I was worried about that. This, you cannot cure it, um, letting them know, again, that this is, this is a permanent thing. It is normal to wish so hard and want so hard for that person to come back that we start to try to come up with ways that we might be able to make that happen, but it is not their job to make that person come back, um, and, and it is not their responsibility, uh, and it never was. And I think, like I, like I shared in the story previously, I think a lot of children they want and they wish so badly that were true, they go into the magical thinking and start to create these narratives. It also is pretty prevalent in movies where we see um, even for a time, um, someone who has died come back. And so this is, a, this is a good time to talk a lot about like, okay, we have imagination and we have reality and imagination is really fun, but it doesn't change what can happen in reality and just really practicing the difference between those two things. And for children who have experienced a death recently or an upcoming death um, that is predictable, uh, a, lot of, a lot of fear and worry and wondering might live in, okay, if, if my parent dies or my caregiver dies, who's gonna take care of me? Um, and that can exist previous to a death, but if, again, if it's a, a two caregiver household and one person has died, it can start to come up afterwards as well. Oh, I only have one more caregiver left. What does that mean when, um, when they die? Who is going to take care of me? And so this, we can see really big fears coming out in, their, in grief um, as well, because they've realized in the hardest, worst way possible that like the people who are supposed to, supposed to be able to stick around to care for me, um, that doesn't always happen. And therefore I need to be, I need to be prepared for that. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with kids who believe that they'll go to an orphanage or they just will have to figure it out on their own. Um, and so part of grief work is sometimes like dispelling that fear with some really hard, hard realities to talk about. But if that's their big fear, then why wouldn't we tell them about a will and a cust and like what custody looks like if someone died and that can be a hard conversation for caregivers, especially if someone has died recently. Um, but it can be so important in helping children cope with their, their big fears around that are almost more like tangible or practical. And then it, those fears are getting in the way of them moving through their other grief feelings because they're so focused on that fear. When we are experiencing um, or when we are supporting children who are grieving or humans in general, I think we sometimes forget that it is enough to be there. Uh, this concept of bearing witness, what it is, is showing up, being an active listener, not trying to fix anything, not trying to um, silver lining anything. It is simply being there. 
Um, empoweredthroughgrief.com is a great website. Um, Megan Devine, who has written a book called It's Okay uh, Not to Be Okay and did a lot of grief work, um, is kind of the driving force behind that. And this is a great quote from there about just bearing witness. So being witnessed in our grief is medicine. Being held and supported in the bravery required to reconstruct our identity and rebuild is healing. Allowing community to fill the gap between the support we get and the support we actually need can be life-changing. So I think sometimes we think we're not doing enough, but there are so few people that can sit in what's really hard and what's painful, especially with children without trying to fix it or distract or move away from it, that actually being able to do that is absolutely enough and it makes them feel safe and capable of feeling their really hard feelings. And it's important to give space for those really hard feelings because grief impacts not just the feeling part of us, but it impacts how we view things spiritually, what our belief systems are, um, socially, how we engage, uh, how we connect with people behaviorally, especially for children. Um, tough behaviors may start to come out because there's so much pent up energy and emotion and they just don't know what to do with it all and therefore they need to somehow communicate it. Um, but the way that needs to happen is, uh, is through their behavior. Psychologically and physiologically, we know that we carry really, really tough um, emotions in our body. And we know that trauma and anxiety and all those sorts of things Yes, we have the thinking part. Yes, we have the feeling part of those. And we also have the sensation part or the somatic part of those experiences as well. And if we're not giving space for children to grieve and to have tough conversations and to explore that grief, then all of these parts of their growth and their understanding can really be impacted and usually not in the most positive way if we're asking them not to be active grievers. So children grieve in chunks over short and long-term times. So what this means is that often you'll see a child who is in their grief. They'll be devastated. They'll wanna talk about their person. And within minutes of that, they might be off playing. Um, and this is actually a, a really cool, natural way that children are able to regulate themselves. They're able to feel really hard stuff and then move out of it and give some relief and then come back to that really hard stuff. And I think sometimes that almost plays into the fact that we don't recognize that children are, are active grievers because as we move through um, our life stages, we, as we get older, we're more likely to grieve in a more consistent way. So it's kind of like an always bubbling experience or sometimes it bubbles over, um, but it's always kind of there with us. Whereas children will be very in the moment with their grief. And then again, very in the moment with whatever they're doing after that. So it can almost seem like, oh, were they even really grieving? But absolutely they were. Um, like we talked about with the, with the changes and new develop levels of development, children's grief changes as they go into those different ones and their understanding grows and evolves. Um, adults grieve slowly and steadily with fluctuations in intensity, which, um, which is kind of what I was saying. There's, uh, I think actually the quote's coming up, but, um, but it just talks about the difference as if for adults, we're grieving, when we grieve, we're wading through a river um, and we're kind of always in it. There's some tougher parts, some faster moving parts, that sort of thing. Um, whereas for children, it is almost like puddle jumping. So they're really in the puddle and then they're out of it and then they're jumping in the next puddle and then they're out of it. Um, but all this to say, these are good guidelines. There's no really specific age rules around grieving. Um, it looks different for everyone. Uh, and that's why sometimes we miss it. Um, and that's okay. We just gotta, you know, we missed it. Let's come back to that. I'm sorry that I didn't address your thoughts and feelings about this. I'm sorry that, that you're hurting so much. Um, and then we have a kind of a spectrum of grievers, intuitive to instrumental. So intuitive grievers are going to be those people who want to talk about it, need to sit with it and feel it um, and really uh, kind of just flow with what it is. Instrumental grievers are going to want to do those things like 
uh, more activity-based or um, task-based grieving. So they might be organizing a memorial or planting a tree or something like that. And that's how they need to process their grief. They need to feel like they're doing something. Um, and obviously it's a spectrum. So we all fall somewhere along it. Um, and there is no right or wrong way to go about that. It's just checking in with yourself when you are grieving and checking in with, um, with children and providing many ways that they can engage with their grief and figuring out what feels the best for them and for yourself as well. So on the left of your screen, we have a little picture of maybe what we might want grief to look like. We want it to be a process. We'll move through the tough feelings and then we'll adjust to it. Whatever has brought that grief on. Um, it's not how it is. It's a lot more like on the right hand of your screen. It is messy and it is confusing and it can feel terrible sometimes. And we bounce from many different emotional and social and cognitive experiences in our grief. And the reality is that it is never, we're never over it. There is no timeline on grief. And I think a really common theory that we hear about are the five stages of grief, which, um, yeah, things that are hard to control and hard to understand as humans, we want to apply some sort of structure to. So it makes sense. Wouldn't it be nice if we could put five stages of grief and that could be it. And it's like a roadmap for everyone to follow. You just need to move through these feelings um, and then you'll kind of be done. But what we know is that that doesn't hold true. And actually believing that that's the way we're supposed to grieve um, leaves a lot of people feel like they're feeling like they're grieving wrong or if it's been a long time and they're still having grief come up, that that's shameful and they shouldn't share it. And we wanna make sure that we're broadening the conversation around grief, not just for children, but also for everyone in the sense that we can feel it in so many different ways. And why would it ever go away? Um, because it is, it's how, it's how we react to a loss and that loss doesn't just cease to exist. When we're looking at children's grief, it looks messy, but there are some things that can be cues to you that, um, that a child is grieving and that they need probably um, some more outlets for their grief and some more explicit conversations around grief. So physical symptoms. Um, children don't always have the words to describe what's happening, but, uh, but they will start to feel it in a more physical way. So stomach aches, headaches, that sort of thing. Uh, it's of course always important to go and check out any, rule out any physical health reasons for these things. But if you know that a really big loss or change has happened recently and stomach aches are coming up, you know, anytime you try to talk about it or anytime they're trying something new, like these sorts of things, um, it's a good thing to keep kind of your, your, on your radar. Um, changes in sleep patterns. So this kind of goes one of two ways often with children. They might be exhausted all the time just from carrying around those really heavy, big feelings. Um, and that might look like sleeping a lot, or they might have a lot of trouble going to sleep because that's when their worries and their fears and their feelings start going. Um, and they're really not able to fall asleep or they're waking up at night with some pretty big wonders and um, worries. Easily irritated just like adults, when we feel like our bucket of coping is very full, uh, we're more, we're quick to become irritated and we're quick to become angry. And that holds true for children as well. Um, emotions are like energy in our body. We carry them. And if someone is having a lot, a lot of sadness around the experience of grief, then they might be more lethargic, almost like carrying a weight with them. They might move slower or um, talk slower or just appear to be very unmotivated or something like that uh, versus if there's more like kind of anxious energy around it and fears and worries that might come out as uh, greater hyperactivity um, less ability to focus more disruption in classes that sort of thing uh, anger outbursts anger is a feeling that really allows us to kind of um, emote in a big way often and when we have a lot of confusing feelings to be able to just push that out is so important an increase in death play children 
understand their world often through play. So you might notice that if a children, if a child has had a grief uh, experience recently, that they're playing out different scenarios, um, either that are true to what they've been through or related in some tangential way. Um, and I think it's important to engage with that. We don't want to shut that down um, because that can help us build a really big understanding with the child of like how they understand this and, and how their grief is, is coming out. Um, repetitive asking of questions. Adults, we need to hear something new at least three times for it to stick is what is what we know. So how could children not A, need to hear it more and B, even more when it's something hard that we either have trouble or don't want to believe? Um, loss of confidence or fear. To be confident or fearless, we need to have a sense of stability to move from. And when someone in your life has died or your feelings feel all confusing and something has changed in a big way, it's really hard to find that stability for some time. And children might need help rebuilding that sense of stability and safety so that they can proceed into new things with confidence and, and with less fear. Uh, and an increased need for affection. They just need reassurance. They need to know that like, you can be there with them in the hard, um, and, and sometimes they just need a hug. So what grief is not, grief is certainly not predictable uh, as we talked about, uh, but it's also not abnormal. It is a absolutely natural human and even um, living things uh, experience. There's a lot of animals that grieve as well in their own way and have mourning periods and everything. And it is certainly not something that needs to be fixed. So when grief comes up, it's really important to be able to connect. This is a great video um, just about connecting in grief. And, um, and yeah, I think it does a beautiful job of talking about how we can, how we can connect um, without trying to fix grief. Oh, let's see if I can get this to play. There we go. So what do we do about all the pain we see in the world? All the pain we feel in our own lives? And why does it seem like our best efforts to help somebody feel better always backfire? I've been studying intense grief and loss, baby death, violent crimes, accidents, suicides, and natural disasters. And I've learned something really interesting. Cheering people up, telling them to be strong and persevere, helping them move on, it doesn't actually work kind of a puzzle. It seems counterintuitive, but the way to help someone feel better is to let them be in pain. This is true for those giant losses and the ordinary everyday ones. Educator Parker Palmer writes, the human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed exactly as it is. He's talking about acknowledgement here. Acknowledgement is this really amazing multi-tool. It makes things better even when they can't be made right. For example, somebody's struggling. Their baby died or there's been a bad accident or their mom got sick and they're just sad. It's way more helpful to join them in their pain than it is to cheer them up. But here's what we tend to do instead. You have two other children, you need to find joy in them. Or, you know what you need? You just need to go out dancing and shake it off. Or, I felt really sad once. Did you try acupuncture? We're not really sure what to do with someone's pain, so we do what we've been taught. We look on the bright side. We try to make people feel better. We give them advice. It's not like this is nefarious. I mean, we try to cheer people up because we think that's our job. We're not supposed to let people stay sad. The problem is you can't heal somebody's pain by trying to take it away from them. Now, acknowledgement does something different. When a giant hole opens up in someone's life, it's actually much more supportive to acknowledge that hole and let pain exist. It's actually a radical act to let things hurt. It goes against what we've been taught. In order to really support you, I have to acknowledge that things really are as bad as they feel to you. If I try to cheer you up, you end up defending yourself and your feelings. If I give you advice, you feel misunderstood instead of supported. And I don't get what I want either because I wanted you to feel better. It's pretty rare that you could actually talk somebody out of their pain. 
Rarely does the admonishment to look on the bright side actually heal things for someone. It just makes them stop telling you about their pain. It's so tempting to try to make things better. When somebody shares something painful, it's much more helpful to say, I'm sorry that's happening. Do you want to tell me about it? To be able to say this hurts without being talked out of it, that's what helps. Being heard helps. It seems too simple to be of use, but acknowledgement can be the best medicine we have. It makes things better, even when they can't be made right. I think this just does such a good job of talking about how to show up for someone who's um, hurting, but, and especially for children. I think that we often move into certain um, roadblocks to communication with hard things. So just a little bit of a review on what that video was kind of getting at, but please take whatever feels relevant and, and important to you from that video. Um, uh, we know that there are certain roadblocks to having effective, tough communication. Um, the first being the fix it trap, uh, making sure that we're not just trying to make um, make children feel better with, with platitudes or trying to fix something that is really unfixable um, because this often skips over the acknowledgement and the validation of what's hard and what they're feeling. Advising or giving solutions uh, the, in that video. Uh, have you tried acupuncture? It can be really minimizing as far as what, what a child or even an adult is feeling. Praising, I think praising is important, absolutely, with children, but just being really careful about what we're praising. Um, this idea of being like, you're so strong, you went back to school after three days, or you haven't cried at all, these sorts of things. We don't want to praise those because, um, because that shuts down different ways of being in your grief, and being in grief is strong whatever that looks like and reassuring, especially false reassurance. Yes, say things like, oh, I'm here if you wanna talk about hard stuff, I can sit in the hard stuff with you. Um, but saying things like time heals all wounds or everything will be okay, um, that's not gonna be true. Uh, you can't keep that promise and kids know that and you know that. So just being very real about it. Um, when we think about talking about grief, I think sometimes we do have significant barriers um, about this specifically, and we worry about saying the wrong thing or taking away hope, um, being afraid of what we might face as far as an emotional reaction goes from uh, the person, um, not wanting to increase their anxiety, wondering if it's our job, am I being intrusive by bringing this up, especially if our role is a bit ambiguous. Um, also, if you're working with children and you're not sure how their parents or caregivers feel about um, talking about death and dying, just being worried about getting on the wrong side of, of what a parent might want to do. And also cultural backdrop. There's a lot of different beliefs around how we talk about death, a lot of different cultural norms and that sort of thing. Um, all of these are very valid. I would still say it is really important to include children in our conversations about grief and death and dying because all of these things do not take away from the fact that every single person is going to face something like this in their life um, at some point. I just wanna make sure that we're practicing cultural humility in grief, um, recognizing and address, addressing our own biases and limitations. Um, I think this is uh, really important. Check in with yourself, check in with how your grief shows up, how you expect it to show up for other people in that way and your, what your expectations are as far as how death is talked about and conceptualized as well. There's not just one way to do this. Uh, societal and structural power imbalances. So what is the predominant narrative around grief and what happens and who is erased in this and who is not? Um, also, the, for a while, the research was kind of talking about cultural competency, and I think just remembering that we can't be competent in someone else's culture, nor can we even really in our own. Um, and so just remembering that, like, you've got to kind of work together to figure out how the child understands and how what kind of context they've grown up in around grief and death um, and being really uh, vulnerable. So not going in as the knower, uh, going in from a place of 
let's figure this out together and let's learn. And um, I'm here to learn what your experience of grief is, not to tell you what grief is like. Um, Brene Brown, staying vulnerable is a risk we have to take if we want to experience connection. And when we, I think about all the barriers to talking about grief um, and death with children um, and all the reasons we may not want to do it or we may hold back, um, it has to do with being vulnerable and doing the wrong thing or messing up, but children need connection when they are grieving. And therefore we've got to show up for them. And we've got to do it and be vulnerable. And if we mess up, we own up and we apologize and we repair and we figure it out because children should not have to go through this alone. It's also really important as you kind of explore how you are gonna engage with grief for other people, check in with your own grief and the ways it's impacting you because we don't just carry our own grief, we're humans. We will carry other people's stories of grief and we need to give that space and we need to give our own experiences space. So here's just a couple of ways um, that you can do that, but you've got to find what works for you and what allows you to feel those feelings and be with grief. There's been a lot of collective grief lately um, in the world and with the 250 Indigenous children who were just found their bodies, um, that has brought really brought this to the forefront uh, for me, I think, just in recognizing that, um, that when a community experiences something, that grief, uh, that collective grief is a whole other thing. Um, and just making sure that we're giving space in our communities for there to be collective grief, whether it be with this new um, information that's come to light or, well, it's not new, but the discovery of these children's bodies is, but experience is not. Um, but sorry, as we collect, as we experience COVID as well, there's a lot of collective grief in that. So just finding ways to attend to that at the same time as attending to own, our own personal griefs. Signs to seek more support. So if you're working with a child or yourself or finding there's changes in sleeping and eating that don't feel right, behaviors, changes in behaviors that change that last a long time and are causing a lot of distress, uh, any feelings that feel really big and hard and that a child doesn't know how to deal with um, and seem to be taking over a lot of time and space, panic attacks, um, what that can feel like. It's a lot of physical things, fast heart, tight chest, numb limbs, fast breathing, feeling like you might die. Um, and thoughts of hurting yourself or about suicide. So that's a good time to seek more support. Uh, and we'll just end uh, before questions on this quick quote that I really love. Uh, it helps me understand why grief never goes away. That's why I really love it. Uh, I don't actually know where it's from. So if anyone does, I would love to give the appropriate um, acknowledgement for it, but uh, it's one of those things that just kind of floats around the internet, I think. Um, grief I've learned is really just love. It's all the love you cannot greet. You, you want to give, but cannot. All the uns unspent love gathers in the corners of your eyes, the lump in your throat, and in the hollow part of your chest. Grief is just love with no place to go. So when I think about grief and I think about the idea of it being love with no place to go, why would we ever want someone to get over that? Why would we ever want to move a child through that more quickly than they're ready to go through it? Um, we want to acknowledge that grief does not exist without love. And yes, it is painful. And yes, it is terrible, but it is necessary. And um, dealing with it is also necessary. And our role in doing that with children is so important because um, it's our job. We got to teach them how to grieve or at least open the door to let them have the space to do what they need or want to do with their grief. So um, we'll, I'll turn it on over so that we can move on to any questions that might have come up. Uh, I'm happy to answer, to the best of my ability, any and all questions. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. That was such an important discussion, and uh, I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure that our, our uh, attendees on the call today did as well. So we do have some questions that came through, and we'll jump right into those. And for those of you who uh, have questions, you're welcome to put that in the, the Q&A box and we'll uh, try to get to as many as, as we can. So um, this is a question about non-death grief and you mentioned some examples of that. So, you know, yeah. divorce, new friend groups and older sibling moving away. Um, 
So should we start discussions about that early in life with a child? And do you have any tips for how to have that sort of dialogue when it's a little different? It's not, you know, yeah. grandma's dying, you're going to go to her funeral. It's, yeah. you know, how, how would you have conversations about those non-death yeah. um, grief? It's a really good question. Um, similarly to how I would start a, a conversation about uh, death-related grief is first developing an understanding of what the child understands about it. So one of my first, first, one of my favorite, usually one of my first questions too, when I meet a client is, so what is your understanding of X situation? So what is your understanding of what it means when your brother goes to university or when your brother starts his job and moves to a, a different place? Um, and then have them explain to you like what they're thinking it might look like and talking about the feelings that exist in that and um, allowing space for any of those feelings. Well, I'm worried that I won't see him as much. Of course, you're worried that you're not going to see him as much. That sounds really hard. Um, and it is true. You're not going to see him as much. And can we do come up with um, to help with that if that seems appropriate? If they're moving really far away, then um, just acknowledging that and everything. So I would start with what they understand. And then like you can label, they can talk about their different feelings or what they're worried about and labeling those feelings or the experience for them. And then bringing it all together by saying, hey, you know, you've mentioned this feeling and this feeling and this feeling. And this is a really big change that's coming up. And not having your brother around is going to feel like there's someone, something missing. And we actually have a word for all of that together. And it's called grief. And it happens in lots of different ways. And this is one way where you might be feeling it would be kind of how I'd engage in that conversation. Thank you. Uh, we did have a couple people chime in about the quote uh, and they say it's from Jamie Anderson. So amazing. Um, thank you uh, for the, the folks who chimed in on that. It's very helpful. Um, you know, I've asked several webinars at this point that I've done and this is the first one where people have been uh, able to tell me and I'm so not surprised by the community <laughs> that this is it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. I will adjust that slide immediately so that I can get that. I can give Jamie the appropriate um, acknowledgement. Sounds good. Um, and you mentioned uh, this a little bit as you were nearing the end of your presentation about, you know, how to take care of yourself as well yeah. um, when you're grieving. So if, say, a parent or a grandparent is struggling with, um, you know, a death that they're also experiencing, how do you have any additional tips for how they can appropriately be there for the grieving child um, in addition to what you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so I think the first thing to remember is it's okay to grieve in front of children. Um, I think sometimes we feel hesitant to let children see that we ourselves are hurting because we think that that will make them think of us as not capable of taking care of them um, or something like that. So just first of all, I want to say that very clearly that it is okay to grieve um, in front of children and to talk about the fact that this is hard and you feel sad and you have worries and sometimes you cry at night or whatever it is. Uh, the one thing I will say is we don't want to take away their sense of like, I can take care of you. So if you need to have a really hysterical cry, totally normal, maybe don't do it in front of the the child, um, maybe that's a time to kind of take your space. Um, but then as far as like looking after yourself, um, in the moments when you're having tough conversations with children, I would say that a lot of like grounding, I do a lot of deep breathing. I hear a lot of hard stuff. I care about the clients that I see. Um, I do a lot of deep breathing, just feeling my feet on the ground, reminding myself that I'm safe in this moment, that um, it's okay for people to feel hard feelings. Cause I think when something comes up, like how do I cope with this child and mine? It's about like, oh, I can't fix this for myself and I don't need to fix it for them either. So just reminding ourselves of that. Um, make sure you're giving yourself time to process and feel your own grief, whatever that might look like. For me personally, I like to go ahead and walk or go for a run. And that's where I kind of sort my thoughts. And I often will, will imagine them kind of moving um, behind me as I've gone through them and like given them space. Um, I think that checking in with yourself, like I said, we often carry this in our body. Um, so noticing, do I have a tight chest tonight as I'm going to sleep? really checking in and asking yourself, what might that be trying to tell me? If that, if that tightness in my chest could talk, what would it be saying? And just really addressing those tougher parts. We have so many indicators, but we've become such a like head-based society. We think so much that sometimes we get in the way and it's reconnecting um, with our bodies, with the things that are telling us that they're off um, and find your outlet 
find your person or people that you can go to and you can have tough conversations with and they can show up in the way that you need them to. And I think what you might find is there are some people who will surprise you in the, in the ways that they can show up for you in such wonderful and helpful things. And there will be some people that you learn the hard way or not your people that you can go to with that doesn't make them less important in your life. It just means that you got to find your safe people that aren't going to try and fix it, that are going to be there and bear witness um, because connection is so important. Yeah. Thank you. And I think that's a really good point that you mentioned about um, sort of doing the body scan and seeing what you're experiencing. And sometimes, like you said, that it just, it, it's not at the top of mind and we, we don't notice, or there might be, there's something that's happening and you wouldn't automatically think it's because of the, the grief that you're experiencing, but on, you know, yes. deeper reflection, you're like, oh, well, this is all adding up. So yeah, yeah. that's a, a good uh, thing to keep in mind. Um, I think this is a, a really interesting question that came through. Yes, um, yes. How do you explain cremation to? Oh, thank a, you for asking that. I meant to, I meant to like, when I mentioned it, I was like, I need to remember to say that. <laughs> yeah, good question. So um, cremation is a hard thing to explain, obviously, because like, it sounds pretty terrible when you just lay it out there. Um, but uh, the way that I'll explain it is after a body stops working, and remember once it stops working, the body cannot feel pain or feel fear anymore. Um, we sometimes cremate the body. And what that means is that we put it in a hot, hot room, so hot that it eventually turns the body into something that looks like sand or ash. Um, and this is used in different belief systems. And um, sometimes it can signify uh, the person being set free or whatever it is. But just remember that the, that the body cannot feel any pain or fear when that happens. Try to stay away from things like, you know, fire or burning because those that imagery can be quite difficult for some children, especially if they have a very visual imagination that can really stick for them. Um, I think another quote, this is just a side note on cremation, but more and more it's becoming um, a common practice where you can actually go and view the cremation at certain places. And, um, and I think that that can really dispel some of the fear and worry. Um, but again, obviously do this with caution, explain what it'll look like, check in with the child if they want to, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. 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 And how, um, you know, with cremated remains, sometimes they're buried or, you know, yeah. scattered or, or whatever. But what if um, a family chooses to have the ashes remain in, in their house? Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to uh, explain that to a child or if the child is maybe, feeling a little uncomfortable or confused yeah. by it? Is there a way to address that with, um, with them? Yeah, and I think that again, that, that starts with just working to understand where that confusion or, or um, whatever it is that's coming up for them, where that's coming from. So again, what's your understanding of what this means to have this here? I can see that you're uncomfortable with it. Where is that, Tell, talk to me about that discomfort. And, um, and just really having to understand what is it that's bringing that up for them? Because um, that can be, who knows, like a, a version of the story that is not actually steeped in the truth or in science. And in that fact, we wanna kind of re-story that with them or fix that narrative so that they don't have to feel fear around it. Um, also, I think just familiarity, getting them used to it, letting them know that it's okay for that to be there and it doesn't, it's not something scary or gross or anything like that. Um, I mean, it depends on the child, but I had one client who like really wanted to see the ashes. So like we checked and it was okay with the parents. I wouldn't do this anyway, other, <laughs> the other, uh, otherwise, but um, we opened up the urn and, and looked at the ashes and they like touched the bag that it came in and everything. And it really dispelled any sort of like fear that they had around it or uncertainty because they could see the tangible thing. Um, but yeah, uh, to back it up, just really understanding what it is about it. And then that will kind of dictate how you move forward with it, I think. And getting beyond the mystery of what, what is this yeah. box and what does it mean? And it, yeah. this is grandma, but it's not, but how do yeah. I, you know, comprehend that? Yeah. Um, you can also make it, sorry, this just came to mind, um, but you can also make it like an opportunity to connect, right? So rather than being like this, like this was grandma now it isn't, I mean, you don't want to push a child there if that's not comfortable for them. But um, I've seen a lot of sort of uh, 
urns and everything used as a memorial space or an altar for the person who has died um, in the home. And it can be a place where you go and you like offer something or you have conversations with them. Um, I have one client that has like a, they put like a mailbox by it. So they write notes to their person each night and put it in there. Um, the notes just accumulate they know that they're not going, like, you don't want to take the notes away and make them believe that the person's coming and getting them or anything. But, um, but yeah, it can be a really positive association too. That, uh, that's a nice way to lead into my next question, which is about uh, the relationship with the person who died. The relationship yeah. doesn't end, it just changes, it looks different. So what are ways, um, and I, I like the examples that you, you shared, but what are some other ways um, to help children uh, yeah. to start forming, you know, a healthy relationship with their, their person who's, who's, uh, who has died. Yeah. I think it's like something that I'll often do, um, to kind of start out with that is, is like, let's draw a picture of your family or let's make like family puppets. And that really opens up the conversation. A lot of kids will be like, do I draw my dead person, um, in this picture? Should I make a puppet? And I'm like, well, are are they still part of your family? Are they important to you? Um, and sorry, the way that I just said that sounded like there was judgment in it, but I say it with a much more neutral tone. Um, but uh, yeah, and giving them space to recognize that like, just because this person died doesn't mean that they aren't part of my family, they aren't still my friend, all this sort of stuff. And then how to do, how to develop that moving forward. Um, oh, there's so many different ways, but I, things that I really love are like, this idea of a mailbox and yeah, writing notes, having a daily sort of ritual around how you're connecting with them for some kids. Yeah. Maybe like I use writing notes because I just had a session where we were talking about that. So it's very front of mind. But um, the other thing is having nightly conversations. Like you can talk out loud to your person. I think we just have so many constraints around what it looks like to grieve. Um, I encourage uh, kids to like keep items of clothing that they really enjoy about from their person and maybe they sleep in that sometimes or they snuggle with that if they need to feel extra close to them. Um, I think there's some really cool stuff to continue relationships on that can be done prior to the person dying if that is part of the experience, some legacy building stuff. I have um, a family that before their, their person died, they did this like questions with dads video set segment where they could ask like any series of questions and they have like a bank of 300 videos um of just like quick questions quick answers so that they can continue that on that is not everyone's experience I don't pretend it is um, but another way you can kind of do that is you sometimes I'll do like a web with with clients around like who are the people that hold information that you still want to know about your person can you go and like can you have like a talk about your brother date or something like that um, and continue learning and evolving your understanding with them? And I think a, an important part of that conversation is too, just as your relationship will change and continues to evolve, your feelings about them will too. And so it's normal if you feel frustrated with them at some point, even though they're not here um, or angry, just like you would if your sister was in the other room, you know, like these are all, there's a lot of space for all of this too. Thank you. That, those are all really helpful um, things to keep in mind and, and that, you know, there's so many different legacy projects and, and different, you know, meaningful um, ways to, to keep somebody's memory um, alive after they're no longer here. It's um, a lot to consider, but we appreciate that. Um, so we're at uh, four sixteen yes. minute over Eastern time. Um, there's a couple of quick comments I just wanted to share with you, Lisa, Please. that came yes. through. Um, so these are a few different people's comments, but one of them said, "This is one of the best presentations I've attended." Um, oh, thank you. Just a quick thank you for all this great information. You did a fabulous job. I'm so grateful for your expertise in helping children to grieve. And uh, another person, this was very helpful, informative, and an important presentation. So uh, we certainly echo all of those comments. It's been so wonderful having you, Lisa. And Thank you uh, for having me. So much. Um, there is in the, the chat, uh, Nicole posted a link to our session next week. It is our last uh, session in our grief literacy um, webinar series. So we hope everyone can attend. If you haven't registered already, you can do so um, through that link. And we'll also be sharing this on our social media platforms. So that's Wednesday, June 9th at 3.30 p.m. 
um, Pacific time. And the topic is cultural humility, which Lisa touched on today, but we'll be getting into further next week. So once again, thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Thank, thank you, you so to much. all of our attendees and have a great afternoon.